Evan, thank you so much for joining me in class and session. We're delighted that you're doing this. How are you doing in the pandemic? Are you quarantined? It looks like you're at home. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for having me. We've certainly been spending a lot of time at home together as a family, which has actually been one of the big uh, blessings from this whole uh, crisis. Have you, um, I found that I'm doing as much work, doing it more productively, kind of like all the white space that exists when you're traveling around, getting on planes, doing all this stuff is kind of, you know, work is now work and that frees up time to think time to be with my wife, time to be uh, uh, working out, staying healthier. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of the best of times in many ways and the worst of times for so many people that are hurting. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the time with my uh, family has been unbelievable. You know, I used to leave for work before our kids woke up and then I'd get home uh, after they'd fallen asleep. And, you know, that just wears on you over time. And so this idea that, you know, we can be more productive and spend time together uh, with our families, which obviously leads to happiness. <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, that that's just a real, a real benefit of this time. Has, have you, uh, have you learned that um, being off site, being off, you know, off the, corporate uh, campus has, uh, has decreased or increased productivity or workers uh, continuing to step up in this new environment? And will you go back to the old way of doing things based on this two month experience? Our, our team's done an incredible job, I think largely because they have these really close uh, relationships that they built while they were you know, in the office together. So we've been able to really lean on that connectivity as a team uh, to, uh, to be uh, way more productive, frankly, than we were uh, when we were all working from the office. I do have some concerns about like the sustainability of this pace because <laughs> uh, it's all work all day long and there's not as much separation between you know the home and, and the office. And so I think that could be harder over a longer period of time. But I definitely think uh, you know there'll be a lot more flexibility, a lot more openness to people working from home uh, given these circumstances. And definitely, you know, it's been so much easier to schedule meetings with people. You don't feel like you have to fly across the world to see somebody. I mean, we're hanging out right now and, uh, you know, from home. So I think there are a, a tremendous number of benefits that we'll see uh, into the future. But I think, you know, it's too uh, early to call like a work from home forever kind of situation. Yeah, yeah. So you've always been interested in technology. What was the spark that, that got your interest? And in? do you have mentors that when you uh, began to, you know, act on your interest in technology that uh, pushed you forward? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget uh, when we got our first Macintosh uh, at home and, you know, we had kid pics on there. And so you could draw anything you wanted and then blow it up and just start over. And I remember that amazing uh, feeling because computers really allow you to, to change things really quickly and to iterate and experiment. Um, and that flexibility uh, really just amazed me from a young age. And then, you know, when I was in middle school uh, and high school, my, my best friend in middle school was our computer teacher named Dan. And, uh, you know, he, he helped me a lot and helped me, uh, you know, really fall in love with computers even more. And then Mark, who was our computer teacher in high school, he helped me build my own computer for the first time. And around that time, uh, you know, I, I also learned about graphic design. So I had two graphic design teachers, uh, Tina and Taylor, and they, they also, um, you know, helped me unlock all these amazing things you could do with computers. And so uh, I, I think I was always interested in the technical aspects, but also, uh, you know, in design and what you could create using computers. And that, that was really exciting to me. You, you, you've talked about how you were bullied uh, when you in school. Uh, what, what lessons did you learn from that? And um, to talk about that, because that's still, that's obviously an issue all across the country even today. Yeah, I mean, I think many of us uh, have experienced bullying in school. You know, I think one of the things uh, that was hard for me, my, my parents didn't let me watch TV uh, growing up. And, you know, uh, I, I was really like reading a lot and that kind of stuff. And so it was harder for me to relate to other kids. I didn't like sports, you know, as much as some other kids did. And I really like spending a lot of time on the computer. Um, so, you know, uh, I think uh, it definitely taught me <laughs> a lot about myself and you know, I, I, at the time, you know, I'd listen to music after I got home from school to relax or read a book or something like that. Um, and, and so I think it definitely at a young age, uh, you know, I guess it gave me the confidence to go my own path um, and not worry so much about what other people thought of me. Uh, you know, and I think that helped later on. Did you, uh, do you, you allow television at, at home now? Uh, very rarely. Although, you know, I would say our screen time restrictions have kind of gone out the window with the whole uh, <laughs> pandemic. So <laughs> we're going to have to yeah. claw those back at some point. That's a that's a huge challenge, isn't it? To make sure <laughs> that your kids uh, learn how to play 
use their creativity, not just be kind of fixated on a screen. I didn't have that problem because I'm ancient. <laughs> yeah, and now kids are using their, you know, their phones and computers to talk with their friends and hang out with their friends. So it's hard to differentiate between, you know, our, our uh, boys playing a video game or watching, um, you know, a movie and them just hanging out with their friends. So I think that's kind of part of the challenge with managing technology now. So at, as a student at Stanford, uh, you and a few friends created the first iteration of Snapchat. What was, how did that happen? Um, what was the creative process that led to something so extraordinary? Well, before Snapchat, uh, there was this thing called Future Freshman, which was uh, a project Bobby and I worked on that helped, helped kids apply to college. And it was just a massive failure. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, we'd spent like a year and a half on it and a bunch of time and money. And, you know, coming out of that, kind of walking away from that and realizing we needed to work on something else, uh, was really what led uh, to Snapchat. Because a buddy of mine around that time said, gosh, you know, what if you could send photos that disappeared. And one of the things we learned from building future freshmen was rather than spending all your time, you know, trying to make the perfect product, try to make something really simple and really easy to use and see if people like it. <laughs> so the earlier you can get feedback from people about whether they like what you built, uh, you know, the sooner you'll know if you're onto something, then you won't waste a year and a half building something that nobody uh, wants to use. So we built a little prototype and we started, you know, using with our friends and you know, people didn't care so much about the fact that the photos disappeared. What they loved about it was that they could communicate visually, and they felt that was way more expressive than text, uh, which makes sense. You know, sending a text takes a really long time. You can't show how you feel, can't share your emotions, and so uh, or, or where you are, what you're doing. And so, in one tap with a photo, you can share so much more. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words, something like that. So, um, you know, our, our friends just started using it all the time to talk, um, and that that was a big uh, breakthrough for us. So you mentioned something that I think is so important, um, which is that you, you had a massive failure and it led to what clearly is a massive success. Um, talk, talk to the students about that a little bit, about taking risks, uh, trying things, um, you know, that life is, the journey is really kind of the fun part uh, and that it's okay to fail. Yeah, and, and we definitely try to model that today with our product design process. You know, our design team, uh, maybe for every one good idea we have, there's like a thousand or more uh, that are just absolutely terrible. And so what we really focus on uh, is really like the velocity of ideas. <laughs> because if you recognize that just one in, you know, every couple thousand ideas or whatever is a good one, then the goal actually is just to create as many ideas as possible <laughs> and see if they're good, see if people respond to them, um, and then throw out uh, as many uh, as you can to get to the good ones. And so I think like just trying to keep that pace and not get so attached to ideas, try to learn from those ideas and kind of throw them out uh, if they're not working really quickly, helps you get to a better product uh, or experience a lot faster. So that's definitely something that we, you know, work on a lot. And I think that, you know, even though that was such a painful lesson for us in the beginning, I remember how hard that conversation was uh, with Bobby, you know, when he and I had to decide, gosh, we got to shut this thing down. You know, that, that was so painful, but it unlocked so much more opportunity for us. Yeah. Well, have you ever thought about how uh, a, in your business, you've applied this by encouraging everybody to try things and, and failing is eventually leads to success. I wonder if you've given, I know you're focused on education. Have you given some thought about how you could structure that in, in a classroom setting as well? Uh, that's a really interesting idea. I mean, one, one of the like kind of key tools that we use is, you know, if you're a new designer and you just join our design team, the first day of your, uh, on our design team, you know, we have these design meetings like once a week. So the first design meeting you attend, you have to present work. You have to present your ideas. And what that teaches you very early on is that ideas are not precious. <laughs> um, and you, you, know, you haven't even had an opportunity to learn really what Snapchat's about or what we're working on or understand the priorities. So you're kind of set up for failure, that first design meeting, right? How could you possibly design some brilliant product your first day on the job? I mean, it makes no sense. So by breaking through that barrier and saying like, no, like we're gonna be open with our ideas and talk about them. We're gonna expect that most of our ideas are going to be bad. That starts that flow of ideation. And so, you know, your first day on the job, once you've already failed, it's, it makes it okay <laughs> to fail, you know, uh, go, going forward. And so I think the more that we lower those barriers to creativity, you know, we really believe that everyone is creative, but that fear suppresses creativity. And so you have to break through that fear. And so I think trying to bring some of the those principles into the classroom, just reducing the barrier by encouraging people to express themselves, almost encouraging them to fail uh, with their ideas uh, can just make it less scary. Then, you know, failure isn't scary anymore. I love that. That is so, that is so cool. <laughs> Look, how did, so you, you got this idea and then you had to go fundraise, I assume. 
How was that? What was that like? That, you know, that was really difficult, especially in the first uh, year, because uh, they didn't really understand how this could be a really big idea or a big business. And it was really Bobby who started the business uh, with me who said, you know, gosh, if people use their camera 10 times a day, instead of once a week or once a month, you know, people used to just use their cameras on special occasions, like a birthday party or something like that. But Bobby felt like, gosh, if you use your camera 10 times a day, that could create a really, really big business. And that was really hard to explain to people because it meant that their notion of what the camera was had to change a lot. You know, the camera wasn't just about documenting and saving memories, it was about talking. Um, and, and so trying to help people understand that, especially when they didn't use the product was really difficult. And so the first investors we had were people that had kids that used the product. <laughs> and that made it a lot easier uh, because we didn't have to explain all that much. They saw, you know, in their household every day, their kids using Snapchat and uh, what a difference it made in their lives, how it helped them connect with their friends. And so, you know, the first $485,000 into the company was from, a, you know, a, a, an investor whose kids were just really loved the product. I'm a poor guy. I'm sure it didn't work out really well for him. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, you, you start your business, you, you get it funded, it grows exponentially from, you know, very quickly. And uh, you're now managing people. You're managing, you're creating a vision, you're doing all the things leaders have to do. Were there any insights in that period of massive growth of how you, how you manage people? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are daily insights. And uh, Bobby and I, you know, were so lucky because we, we obviously had never done this before. We never built a company. Uh, but we were really fortunate because in the beginning when we built our company, we got voting control. Um, and that meant that uh, we could fail a ton and make tons of billion dollar mistakes and people weren't able to fire us. <laughs> uh, and so in the beginning when the company was growing and we were making all these mistakes, uh, we really felt like we had permission to do that. We had permission to learn. Um, and so, you know, there are, there are countless uh, mistakes that we made, but I think one thing that made a really big difference in the beginning was that we hired people who had a lot more experience than we did and often way ahead of, you know, when we, uh, you know, quote unquote, needed them. So, you know, when there were just eight of us or something working in this little beach house, we hired someone who, you know, managed 300 engineers at Amazon and they came into our company and they were leading a team of like, six engineers or whatever it was. Um, but they, they helped us understand, you know, what it's like to lead a bigger team. And then, you know, later on we hired people who had led teams of, you know, thousands of people and they taught us more about leadership uh, and the way um, to, to grow the company. But I think, you know, the biggest thing and the biggest takeaway for us uh, over the years has just been the importance of our values. You know, we have these three simple values. It's kind, smart, and creative. Uh, and, you know, the moments that have been hardest for us as a company are when we've drifted from those values or we've grown so quickly and hired, you know, a thousand new people who didn't yet fully understand our values. And so we've had to, lot, uh, you know, invest a lot in helping people understand our values and also build, you know, performance management uh, tools and things like that uh, to make sure we're rewarding people for living out our values as we build our business. So how do you, how do you express kindness as a cultural, a, a corporate value? How does, how does that work? I love, I love kindness. I've never heard it spoken about in a corporate context. Yeah, so the, the reason why kindness is so important to us is because in our view, it's inextricably linked with creativity. So what we talked about a little bit before was this idea that if you feel afraid, it's very hard to express yourself and be creative. And one of the times that people feel afraid is when they feel uncomfortable or they feel scared or they're worried someone's gonna make fun of them. And so that's why having a kind culture really empowers creativity because it creates a culture where people treat each other with respect and, and they support one another and therefore people feel comfortable and more creative. Uh, and so for us, you know, kindness, uh, you know, it's everything from just helping out a team member when they really need it to, you know, even things like, uh, you know, making sure that you're not speaking over someone in a meeting so that everyone has the chance to share uh, their perspective or, you know, even having a really difficult conversation with someone and explaining, you know, that maybe Snapchat isn't the right fit for them. That, that's also a kind thing to do because it helps them find a better opportunity where they can really grow. And so, you know, I think kindness takes many different forms. And what we try to do is talk about those behaviors and demonstrate those behaviors on our team so that people really, you know, see kindness like in action. So uh, will you take some questions from students around the country? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So the first one's from Kevin, who's a fourth grader from Mill Creek Academy in Florida. And he's, he's you, you've kind of answered this. What's it like to own your own business? I watch Shark Tank a lot and <laughs> want to create a business. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, well, it's great to hear you're excited about entrepreneurship. I mean, one thing that is guaranteed is you'll learn something new 
uh, every day. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just absolutely uh, exhilarating. So, uh, you know, it's, it's been really fun. My wife's also an entrepreneur. She has her own uh, skincare business. And so, uh, you know, we, we spend a lot of time at home talking about our teams and our products and, you know, the impact uh, that we're trying to create in the world. So, you know, I think that'd be a really fulfilling and fun thing uh, to work on. And I think it's, it's totally uh, worth all of the pain and challenges to make your vision a reality. So the next question is from Mary, uh, and she says, it's, it's, uh, it, there's a question in this, but their first uh, point is she really likes the photo filters on Snapchat. Where'd you get the idea for the filters? Uh, and, and what should the future of education look like? She's, uh, maybe she's gonna be a teacher, I don't know. But. Wow, those are two really big questions. Uh, well, the, the first thing, you know, the, the augmented reality lenses and filters that we have uh, on Snapchat actually originally started, at, you know, in another uh, small company. And we saw what this company was doing and we thought, oh my gosh, it would be so cool to incorporate that into Snapchat. So we ended up partnering together with them and brought their uh, lenses into Snapchat. And since then, the really cool thing that we've done is take all of those tools used to build those lenses and make them available to everyone. So now, you know, people across the world have created over a million lenses uh, using our software and shared that with the Snapchat community. And now we take that software called Lens Studio uh, into classrooms around the world and help students learn how to build uh, with augmented reality. So that's been a really fun product for us. And the most fulfilling thing has been watching all the creativity unlocked uh, around the world. And then I think, gosh, you know, when it comes to the future uh, of education, I think the really interesting thing about education is that, you know, when, we, when we're thinking about education today, really we need to be constantly imagining at least 20 to 30 years in the future, because by the time someone leaves the education system and enters the world, uh, it, you know, it will be 20 plus years uh, later, you know, than they started pre-K or something like that. And so I think trying to imagine what that uh, world looks like is a really helpful tool. I think one thing that stood out to me sort of in my journey is the importance of learning new ways of thinking. So things like creativity and problem solving are really important. I remember when I went to college, uh, you know, we, ha we had to, um, I was in the design program at Stanford and we had to learn how to use all this 3D modeling software. And I, I remember asking the professor, you know, how come there isn't a class that teaches you this skill of using this 3D modeling software? And he said, you know, Evan here, we don't teach skills, we teach how to think. <laughs> and, you know, he, he said, you can learn any, you know, if you learn how to think and you learn how to think creatively and to problem solve, you'll be able to learn any skill you want. So we'd rather teach you uh, about problem solving and creative thinking, design-based thinking here. And that really uh, stuck with me uh, because, you know, as I was growing up and, you know, had the opportunity to attend uh, art school a little bit in my free time in, in high school, it really was skills-based. I mean, it was really focused on mastering skills. And that, that's been super helpful and helps people express their ideas. But I think a lot of the future of education, in, in my opinion, is around cultivating creativity and creative thinking, um, and I think, you know, and problem solving. And I think if we can do that, then I think we'll be able to constantly reinvent education to meet the needs uh, of the future. Great, um, and it, it's, uh, you know, most of the jobs that will exist 20, 30 years from now, um, there'll be a lot of jobs that won't exist that through AI and automation, big data, and all that stuff is gonna transform work. I think the creative, uh, work will be um, in its ascendancy even then. So uh, learning that process at an early age has got to be, got to be uh, really relevant. So you're, you, you dropped out of Stanford and then you dropped back in and graduated. What, what, why did you go back to, to, to Stanford and get your, and finish your uh, degree? Well, oh gosh, so my, uh, my wife was pregnant with our, uh, our first child, uh, Hart, and you know, she and I are, are both entrepreneurs and, you know, neither of us had college degrees. And so I literally just imagined having this conversation uh, with Hart, you know, when he was 17 or 18 thinking about college and having him say, you know, dad, well, you, you know, you and mom didn't graduate from college. Why do I need to go to college? And I was like, oh, I just had this nightmare. Like, how am I going to have any credibility? How am I going to force him to go to school, uh, you know, if I don't finish? And I, I really believe that college is extremely valuable for so many reasons, not just the stuff you learn, but the relationships that you build with other students. And so I, I just never wanted to get into that, uh, get into that debate uh, with our son. And so now I can say, you know, gosh, I went back and finished. And, uh, you know, I really believe you should go to school too. Did you literally go back to, to the campus and I, I went back a couple times. I got to do most of it remotely because we had a, a machine shop here, uh, you know, in our, 
uh, at Snap. And so I, I had to take, actually, it's a pretty funny story because um, I was in this class uh, that, that really is about CNC machining. And, you know, that was the same day uh, or while I was taking that class, that was when we got our first investment in Snap. And I was literally in the back of this class, like constantly refreshing my bank account, seeing when the $485,000 would hit the bank account. And when it did, I, you know, I went up to the professor and I said, you know, gosh, I'm so sorry, but I got to drop this class. And, you know, we, we really need to focus full time on, on the business. And so I went back and took that same class from the same professor. Oh, wow. uh, <laughs> so the world really does uh, uh, come uh, full circle. So um, you're, you're a phenomenal young man with an incredible vision, running a great business. You have a great family. You're committed to all the right things. I, I admire you greatly. And I know the students um, admire you as well. I'm, I really appreciate you uh, joining me in this conversation. I wish you good health and uh, continued success. Thank you so much. Stay safe. I really appreciate it.